name is John Kowalski. I'm part of the marketing team here at BitGardener. And today we're talking dispersion, um, actually going a little bit deeper than usual uh, uh, into dispersion, uh, doing a deep dive here. Um, so this is part one of our uh, pre-dispersion process. We'll do a milling deep dive um, down the road just a little bit. Uh, we are recording this and immediately following the presentation, you'll receive an automated email um, with a link to that recording. Please uh, feel free to share that with colleagues, look at it at a, uh, a later date or, or whatever you'd like. Um, also, uh, if you have any questions, uh, please log them in the chat box located in the bottom right hand corner of your screen. And time permitting, we'll get to them. Um, if we do run out of time, uh, we'll record those and reach out to you individually. Uh, so with that, let me introduce our uh, resident uh, dispersion expert, Mr. Andy Summer, or Andy Stumer. I'm sorry about that, Andy. <laughs> Andy Stumer. He is our business line manager uh, for our dispersions. So with that, uh, Andy, it's all yours, sir. And Andy's calling me. Okay. But I think we're good to go. So thank you everybody for joining us today. So as uh, John alluded to, this is the uh, dispersion deep dive, uh, the first part. Uh, we're gonna cover the pre-dispersion process in a more detailed fashion. And the second part would be more about the milling part. We covered that a little bit, but this is mainly about the pre-dispersion process. And I uh, will cover also some different technologies. Okay. All right, so we're gonna have a quick introduction about VMA. Uh, then we dive right into the actual dispersion process. We're gonna talk a little bit about the different lab and production equipment solutions that we offer. And then uh, a little bit about the QC process and then some of the lab capabilities that we offer here in the US in Wallingford or in Germany uh, at VMA headquarters. We have an outstanding applications lab uh, where we can do a lot of trials and uh, also upscale trials uh, for production equipment. So VMA Getzman uh, is a German company, was founded in 1972 by uh, Hermann and Elke Getzman, uh, that couple on the top right. Um, Big Gardner has had the exclusive distribution rights for the product line in North America since 1988. Um, Big actually has used that equipment for quite a bit longer uh, throughout the laboratory space in Europe and, and the US. And what happened was some customers uh, came in and saw the equipment run at the uh, big USA facility and they wanted to know if they could purchase that equipment. And that was the starting point uh, back then when uh, I think it was uh, Dr. Peter, he decided that um, we would include that in the product line of our big instruments um, group. And that's how that whole thing got started. So the company is still family owned. They have over 100 employees worldwide. Um, and they're known to make really high quality dissolvers, bead mills, basket mills for lab and manufacturing environments. Uh, they also have the Dispermat trademark uh, that you probably have heard before. So they own uh, that name as well. So here is uh, just a quick slide about the company. So you have that building in the middle, that L-shaped building is actually new. Uh, they added a, a, a more split space for design, uh, more office space, as well as more manufacturing space. Um, the company is really flexible to different customer needs. So about 40% of all the equipment that VMA manufactures is custom. So we have a lot of applications where customers require certain uh, components like a nitrogen um, valve or we want to flush inert gas through chambers or want to build a reactor or those kind of products. We can actually help there. And, and develop a solution with the customer. And VMA is really an expert at that. Um, and then 
they have a really nice lab. I mentioned that earlier in in uh, in uh, Germany at their headquarters. The company is about 30 miles east of Cologne. So if you're ever over there and you want to visit the facility, let us know and we can set that up. And the lab in the U.S. is uh, at our sister company's facility, a big USA, and that is up in Wallingford, uh, Connecticut. So just a quick uh, introduction. How do you use disper mats and where? And basically, we were born out of the coatings world, and they were first and foremost really used to uh, disperse pigments. Over the years, uh, the instruments have found new end-use markets uh, that we are in. Obviously, battery is a big one, you know, oil and petrol. Uh, pharmaceutical is another one, agriculture. So there is a lot of different end-use markets where they would be uh, using that type of equipment. But when we talk about dispersing, uh, we really differentiate between different pigment classes. So we have these organic pigments. We have inorganic pigments. We also have functional pigments and the special effect pigments. Uh, some of you well, know those well. These are the silver flake effect colors, which have to dis get dispersed with a little bit more care because you don't want to destroy those special effect pigments that would ruin the effect. So that's done a little bit differently. And the whole purpose of the dispersion prop process is to really improve our overall appearance. Uh, we want to have better gloss, uh, transparency, color strength, uh, and some of, some of these major attributes that we are actually uh, in, impacting by having a proper dispersion. So this is a great slide. It really outlines it well. So we are looking for improvement in our wedding process. Uh, these Van der Waals forces, some of you who uh, have a physics background may have heard uh, about that. These are these invisible electromagnetic forces, binding forces that hold these pigment particles together. Um, and then we want to actually reduce those clusters down to the primary particle size that will give us better color, better gloss, overall appearance is improved. Uh, we get more pig, better pigment efficiency that will help us reduce our raw material costs. Uh, we have more product consistency. Formulation improvement is another net result of having really good um, dispersion. And also we get a more consistent particle size distribution. And finally, we'll also get better upscale results, which is really important if I want to go into manufacturing and I want to use the data from my uh, laboratory scale or my pilot scale process and then go into production. So that's uh, why we're doing it and why, why that, that process is really important. So if we don't follow um, a proper pre-dispersion or dispersion process, it's going to lead us to just poor quality of our product. So we have, uh, you know, issues with color. That might there, there might be a bigger delta between the different lots, um, poor stability of our product, also flocculation of pigments. Obviously, Big USA is really good at helping in selecting the right type of additives that will go in to uh, the formulation that would help avoid those kind of issues, especially with the flocculation, uh, sagging, leveling, settling, as uh, some of these other issues that occur. And then uh, gloss is reduced. Increase in haze is another one that's not on there uh, that co that's coming up. Uh, and then obviously the separation uh, is also another issue that happens if you improperly disperse. So it's really important to remember that we need to get uh, good stability to have better color fastness and that helps us with fading over time. Uh, also our Brightness uh, will be improved. That will give us the best color. Um, the rule of thumb in terms of pigment size is that the smaller our pigment particles, the better our overall appearance. Um, and that will also allow us to use less pigment and cut down on the volume. And that should help us reduce cost and save money uh, if we properly disperse our pigment 
uh, because we don't have to use as much. And usually, the lower the viscosity, the better the particle size distribution, and also it helps us with processing the material. Obviously, there is a, a, a threshold. Ideally, we are looking between 3,000 to 10,000 centipoise. That's a really good range where we're able to process the materials really well. If we are lowering viscosity, it's not an issue. But what that usually means is we have to put in more energy because the material is so low in our viscosity that it's more difficult uh, for energy to get introduced into the mill base. Um, so we have to either drive with higher, more uh, watts, uh, or we just run a different tip speed. So there's some options to compensate for that. We'll talk about that. Um, and then obviously if we are too thick, that gives us different issues in terms of processing. Um, you know, if it's like peanut butter, it's very difficult to, for example, you know, have the blade properly move the product. That would then in some instances require a sweeper blade to really make sure that the product is properly, you know, moved around the container and then that the actual blade can take go over and really disperse uh, these, 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 these larger particles. When you're milling, that's also a big issue. If you have a very high uh, viscosity, it makes it very difficult to process in some cases. For example, a basket mill uh, is not, it wouldn't be possible to use that technology just because the, the product wouldn't flow into the basket and then come back up. Hold on, folks. It seems like we have a bad connection here with our speaker. Andy? Okay. Looks like he's trying to work on uh, some things on his end. Um, you know, please note we are recording this um, and hopefully we can get it going again here. Um, and then uh, Andy, you may have to drop off uh, and then re-log back in perhaps. Um, but we are recording this, uh, you'll receive a link. Um, if you have any questions, uh, please log them in the chat box located in the bottom right hand corner and uh, we'll get to them as soon as possible. Um, Andy, if you can hear me, uh, you may need to log out and then log back in again. Send him a note here. Andy, are you there? Ah, now we can. You're back. Yes. I'm not sure what happened. I apologize. I'm actually in Europe. And uh, for some reason, the internet cut out where I, at the location that I'm at. So I really apologize. So if you can hear me now, just to go back to that slide. So it's really important to remember uh, when we talk about particle size reduction, we really only talk about breaking up these binding forces, not actually destroying the particles. So in, that's usually some confusion, uh, you know, that comes up, but it's really about just particle size reduction and not destruction. Um, agglomerates and aggregates, these are these larger clusters, they're reduced to primary particle size. And I have a slide on that that we'll go through in a minute here. And then really the shear forces are responsible for that separation, nothing else. So the higher the shear, um, the, the better our performance and that will give us better particle size reduction. And then finally, we need good additives to keep our particles in a suspended state. And big additives is really good and they can help with that. Okay, so here is a good slide just showing you different types of pigment classes. You can see uh, yellow and TO2, a lot of you probably are very familiar with that. And it just gives you an idea of, of, of how big these pigments are. Just a slide I threw in there. 
more visual. And so here you can see that uh, that those larger clusters, these are called the agglomerates. And what we really want to do is in the predispersion process, we want to break those up and we want to turn them into aggregates. Aggregates are the smaller clusters, smaller building blocks uh, that circle in the middle. And if we want to go from the aggregate level down to primary particle size, that's when we really need to do the milling. So from agglomerates to aggregates, if we use the cow split, that's the predispersion process. And then from aggregates down to primary particles, that's where we use the different types of uh, milling technologies that are available, which we have a, a part two of this seminar where we dive into that. And uh, uh, at the end, uh, John uh, will send out an email and letting you know when that will take place. So in the dispersion process, it's really about wetting of these solid particles and the mechanical breakdown of these larger agglomerates and aggregates down to the primary particle size. And then at the end, as I mentioned, uh, with the right um, additive, we have to keep these particles in a suspended state and then we need to stabilize them. So Big USA are the experts in recommending the right additive for that. Okay, here is a great slide just showing you in the beginning with the cow's blade, we are wetting our pigments or particles, and then uh, we break up these binding forces, these van der Waals forces, and usually not the case with every pigment. There are a lot of different pigment types, families, but what you're really looking for is about 10 to 20 microns of particle size, and at that point, it's better to start milling. Uh, we can introduce more energy, more efficiency. So in order for us to reduce the particles below 10 microns, usually we need to do uh, some sort of media milling. Okay, here you can see um, kind of like the breakout. So we use a dissolver. Again, as you can see on the slide, about 10 microns are very efficient. And that then uh, we need to do the milling if we want to go smaller. With the right type of milling setup, we're able to go way down sub 100, sub 50 nanometers. Uh, it's not unusual with the right attachments. We have, um, you know, nano kits uh, and dedicated nano milling systems that can be utilized to really uh, use uh, get down that particle size range. Uh, we also have some of the capability up in Wallingford at our uh, head, uh, our applications lab at Big USA headquarters. So if you have any th products that you want to test or come in and take a look, we'll be more than glad uh, to, to discuss that with you and have you up there. So we offer a, basically in this process, the dispersion process, a variety of different technologies, but in the pre-dispersion process, what you really want to look at, and that's the same for all the different types of equipment, is the tape speed should be between 18 to 25 meters per second. That's the sweet spot. That's where you want to be in. And basically, that's where you really start breaking up these binding forces. Anything less than that may give you the same results, but you will take much longer. Or in some instances, you may never get there and get these results that you're looking for. And we would use dissolvers for that actually with those blades. And then we have different types of uh, systems, the SC for production. And we have a, uh, you know, a budgetary model, the LC. We have a really nice uh, small unit for the lab space called the CV with different safety functions. We'll go through those. Uh, CN and AE are more of our higher end models with different um, upscaling capabilities and also data storage capabilities. And then when we talk about the milling, the fine dispersing, um, obviously we have different types of vertical bead mills, basket mills, and then also um, hor horizontal bead mills are also available uh, for lab as well as pipe and, and production. So here is a very important slide and it always comes up is the diameter of the blade in proportion to my container diameter. And you're looking about one third uh, to, in some cases, two thirds. You can see 
on the on the right side there's a nice table and you can see that there is not one blade that fits every uh, one container or there's just one container uh, one blade per container it was really a, a range and depending on the viscosity the flow pattern you can really go and see for example if i have a one liter it's about a quart i can go all the way from a 30 all the way up to 70 so that's quite a bit range but the sweet spot probably what we do in the lab is we use probably use a 50 to 60 millimeter blade depending on the viscosity um, to achieve really good results we have seen in some instances you know if the viscosity is very high we have to go with a little bit of a larger blade to move the product um, and in some cases uh, for certain formulation uh, they require a smaller blade uh, but there is a really nice wide range uh, of different blades as there's also many different blade types so we have a good variety i know that some of the other companies out there offer some very unique uh, blade solutions so go and check that out online then here um, it's a very important calculation it's actually how do you figure out the tape speed so the tape speed is actually the uh, RPMs multiply that by pi times the diameter of your milling disc. Um, in, in this case, we figure out meters per second. So you let's say you have a 50 millimeter blade, you multiply it by times 0 0.05 and then divide everything by 60. And that would give you meters per second if you want to cal calculate that. Um, on our higher end disper mats, that's actually displayed on, on the control panel. Uh, you can see it uh, on the lower end models or the intro models, you'd have to calculate it. Uh, and so why that formula could be helpful. So we have a thing called the donut effect and it's really uh, called that. And the reason is when you look inside of the container and you optimize the dispersion process 18 to 25 meters per second we have a really good viscosity range um, and you should see something like that and then you already know that it's very likely that you're optimizing the process and that uh, things are getting properly uh, dispersed so that is uh, called the donut effect and that's really desirable in the pre-dispersion process when you're milling you don't really have a donut but this is really something that only happens in, in the pre-dispersion process. So blade diameter, geometry of my blade in relation to my container size obviously plays a big role as well. If my blade diameter is too small, I will not be able to maybe get a donut. And if it's too large, maybe I won't have a donut either. So this is really about optimizing all the different variables. And then you should have a donut also if the viscosity is really low it's difficult for a donut to form because it would automatically collapse as soon as uh, it has a chance to form and when the viscosity is too high let's say material is again like peanut butter you will not have a donut because the product just wouldn't move in order for a donut to uh, actually appear so this is something you would see uh three to ten thousand center points range uh, when you optimize these variables we discussed and you should really have a nice looking donut this is what happens um, on the graph so you can see where these uh, at the edges of the blade this is actually where the separation uh, of our particles takes place that's where we break up these van der Waals forces i would have i would say that this also happens below the disc it's not on this uh, picture here, but you would have the similar effect also below the disc, not just on top. So that's something that I think is missing uh, from that particular picture. Okay, here you can see definitely a good looking donut. Uh, we are running 21 meters per second. And uh, at that viscosity range, we are able to put in 850 watts of energy to uh, uh, get that tape speed. So that's what you want, it looks great. Now, in this case, uh, we're not so lucky and we are, our viscosity is different. We're only putting in 320 watts of energy at the same tape speed. That means our viscosity is probably a little bit too low 
and we're not able to properly disperse this material. So what could help there is changing formulation uh, to uh, bump up the viscosity somewhat. You could increase the tape speed uh, more than maybe a better donut could it be. Also what could help is maybe change the blade diameter. That would also be something else that you could look at that would uh, probably help with putting in a little bit more energy. Uh, but that's something right here on this picture that's not desirable. Um, we will call that a poor dissolver print. And then um, we have obviously no donut effect in something like this, where we are running at 20 more meters per second. So tips are okay, but we're putting in uh, way too much energy. So here is the opposite effect. So the product isn't moving really all that well. The viscosity is really high and we are having trouble actually seeing a donut. Could also be that we are still dispersing, but in this case, because of the high viscosity, it's just not possible that, it, that an actual don donut uh, forms. Uh, this is just a slide on uh, dispersion result related uh, to mechanical power. So P, mechanical power, two times pi, times the RPMs, times torque that will give us the amount of energy that we're actually putting in to our mill base. And on the higher end models, we actually show that we can also run uh, our equipment with what is called constant power instead of just constant speed. That way you'll select a certain amount of energy you want to put in, let's say 1000 watts. And then the machine, depending on the viscosity of your material, will automatically adjust the speed to always maintain that, that amount of energy. So if our viscosity is increasing, our speed will decrease because we are maintaining the 1000 watts of energy. If our viscosity decreases, then our speed would increase because we are still maintaining that 1000 watt energy input. And that is something called constant power. And that is sometimes used also to calculate upscale costs or manufacturing costs because it will tell us exactly how much energy we are using in a certain amount of time to uh, manufacture or disperse X amount of product. So that can be very helpful. And that is a feature that we have on the higher end models like the AE or the CA, uh, that option uh, is available. Uh, we can also do what's called the net power calibration, just to mention that that means that we run the machine uh, without any product for, I think, 30 seconds. And then all the values get set to zero, the energy that it's using to operate itself, because the machine obviously is using power just to run the shaft, even if there is no product. So when we do a net power calibration, we factor out that, uh, that influence or that noise. And then we the numbers we see on the display are only uh, related to our product and not the machine input. Uh, and that also is available on the higher end models. So in order for us to optimize our dispersion result, obviously duration plays a time. Uh, here we are looking between 15, uh, so 10 to 30 minutes, some, sometimes um, a little bit uh, longer, or actually less time we have seen, but that's a good number for the pre-dispersion. Uh, we wanna again see a donut effect that would be ideal. And then the tip speed, very important try to stay within 18 to 25 meters per second. Uh, not enough tape speed. Uh, it's just not gonna give us the results in a timely fashion or we may not, never get there. And if we are just putting in too much tape speed, it's kind of like the diminishing return. We're not gonna really gain anything by going too fast. Uh, geometric consideration again, blade diameter in relation to our container vessel diameter, one third. Uh, at least, uh, you know, is the ideal size. And then you can vary that depending on your viscosity. Uh, and then the right type of impeller disc. So again, there's different variations. So you can look on our website to see some differences. Um, some of our competitors offer other solutions. So they're very interesting. But this is something that, um, you know, you can uh, go online and, and look at that. Um, then the amount of mill base, so we recommend at least 50%. That's a good number. If you uh, have more than that, then sometimes you have an issue with products spilling over the con container wall. Um, 
if it's too low, okay, then you can't really maybe navigate the blade, oscillate the blade in the right position. And then sometimes you could end up hitting the container bottom with your blade. That's not ideal. Uh, even though on our machines, we have a safety feature called the working area threshold that actually allows you to lock in uh, these positions at top and the bottom position so that you would never hit the container bottom with the dispersing blade, even if you lower it to the lowest uh, position. Uh, pigment and filler concentration, obviously very important. That's a formulation issue. Uh, we want to keep the temperature ideally as low as possible um, because we're putting in a lot of energy and by lowest possible I mean it's the best temperature for your product. Obviously, if it's too low, in some instances, that will also uh, increase the viscosity, which is not desirable. So you may have to uh, disperse longer uh, or there are some other issues. So, But try to stay within room temperature. Uh, if you go too hot, obviously, that's also a concern, especially if you're running solvent-based products. Uh, we want to stay away from that. We offer cool uh, jacketed vessels, double-walled, uh, for uh, these uh, applications, especially when you're milling. It's a lot more critical because we, that's when we're really introducing a lot of energy into our process, and we really need proper cooling. Not so much in the pre-dispersion process, but again, depends on the formulation, depends on the viscosity, could also mean that you need to cool already during the pre-dispersion process. And then finally, obviously, we want to use the right additives that help us to wet our pigments more, uh, helps with the dispersing process, and then that they don't, the pigments, we don't want them to flocculate. Um, and when we achieve all that and we have this desired particle size and when it goes smaller, that's when we would go over uh, and introduce our material into a bead mill. So the difference here is really with a dissolver, it's a necessary step. Uh, the pre-dispersion before I'm actually going to start milling, I have a limited amount of energy input. It's just such that a blade alone without media is just a blade uh, and will never give a, allow for such a high energy input as you have a milling disc with media. So therefore our shear force is limited and it's really only to deagglomerate. So we are going from the larger clusters, the, uh, these agglomerates down to the aggregate level, and that's when we would use uh, the dispermat or dissolver. Uh, and we are not breaking down to the primary particles with just a disk. Uh, but again, it's really critical that we use that step. And if we stop at the aggregate level, then obviously we're going to have appearance issues and our product is just not, not going to be as consistent and maybe as desirable for the naked eyes if it would if we would go and process this then uh in the secondary step with the media mill where we're able to actually add a lot more energy and then we really break down these binding forces down to the uh you know uh, primary particle size and that allows us to actually go sub uh, micro range all the way down to sub 50 nanometers um we have seen um, that will give us a much better looking product, uh, have better color strength, particle size distribution, transparency, haze, gloss. All these things should be affected by having um, a good processing step through a, through a bead mill. So here is just an example of a standard. Well, this is actually our flagship model, but a really good basic uh laboratory scale benchtop disperser uh in the smaller the units usually the higher the rpm uh because you need a smaller blade uh, on the smaller unit and in order for you to get to 18 to 25 meters per second on a very small blade you need the high rpm capability um on our models we see you can see the cow's blade right here on on the bottom of our shaft but right below the motor is a flange, and that's called the quick disconnect. Um, what a TML, um, a DL shaft, we call it. And it's basically a clamping ring that you can open, and you can rotate that whole assembly 180 degrees, and then you can replace the dissolver shaft, for example, with the rotor stator. 
or you can add a, ba a basket mill or uh, a vertical bead mill all on the same machine. And that is something uh, that is patented with VMA to be a, so versatile with the quick change system. And it basically allows you to purchase one machine for many different types of applications. Um, so on this particular model here, uh, we also offer what's called the C technology. That is a higher end software package, also a high end control uh, module where you can actually see on the display all the critical parameters that you would need in the dispersion process that could be helpful to upscale. You know, obviously your speed is on display, the energy input, you have a value uh, for torque uh, represented in Newton meters, uh, temperature readout and the timer function. And actually the tape speed will also be displayed on, on that particular model. So that's uh, the higher end uh, dispermat called the AE. Uh, you can see right next to uh, the, the column on the bottom, on the right side, you see a little wheel. That wheel is used to actually tighten the container wall, uh, the, the container clamp, and ensure that the container is perfectly centered and really tight because you do not want a wiggling container during the dispersion process. Uh, it's, you know, if you can imagine you run that at 20,000 and then the blade uh, would hit the container wall, that is not a good idea. Um, the second safety feature we have is called the working area. I had mentioned that before. We have an upper and a lower threshold that we can set depending on the size of our container. And we do that electronically on the control panel so basically, when the container is empty, you lock it in place with the wheel, and then you would lower the position of the blade to its lowest point where before it hits the bottom of the container, and then you would lock that in. That is called H2. You just push a button on the control panel, and then you move it up to the top position right before the blade lifts up beyond the container wall, and we will call that H1. That's the upper threshold. Because you wouldn't want to have a, a spinning blade at these RPMs outside of the container. And we have seen, you know, if that safety feature is not engaged or working and uh, on some models that don't have it, then obviously somebody would have products splashed throughout their laboratory or actually could get hurt by uh, the spinning disc. Uh, so that's why that safety feature is really important. Uh, and it's called the working area threshold uh, safety feature and then we can see on the dispermats it's also very important to our, our processing is that we have a shaft guard uh, that allows us to actually run the disperser without having any rotating or moving parts outside of the container uh, so that shaft guard you can as a little thumb screw right there that you can loosen and tighten to move that shaft guard up and down uh, along the shaft to ensure that the, the shaft is properly covered when uh, you are dispersing your material. Okay, then uh, with these different types of uh, tools, we have them, uh, you know, as a homogenizer, uh, there's just a butterfly uh, attachment or a propeller blade that allows you to turn that whole thing into a mixer or a homogenizer. You can also add a rotor stator, as I mentioned. That's an attachment that allows you to emulsify different products at a very high shear rate. And then you would basically uh, mix them uh, or emulsify these products. Uh, that usually is a good idea if the viscosity is very low. Then that's a, a good tool to have. Uh, if the viscosity is very high, uh, nothing would happen. The, Rotor stator would just basically stick in, in, in your in your mill base like a consistency of peanut butter. And there is no way that product would actually get pushed through these little gaps of the rotor and stator. So it wouldn't actually accomplish anything. So the viscosity needs to be really low for that to be effective. And then, of course, these are all out-of-the-box dispersers uh, that have the capability of, you know, obviously using it as the... Uh, dissolver with the with the with the cowl's blade that most of the models ship with a, a number of different blade diameters 
what then you could convert them either to a basket mill by just attaching that uh, with the quick change system or add a milling disc and then use it as a vertical bead mill uh, with our APS system. It's called an air pressure system. It's kind of vertical bead mill uh, setup. That's really nice. And so here is a great picture where you can see uh, just the standard disperser in the middle and then all these different attachments that will go right on it to make that a really a cross-functional piece of equipment. So we got that rotor stator on the top left and we have that APS I just mentioned, that's that vertical bead mill attachment um, on the bottom left. And we also could attach a wall scraping system. That is really important for very viscous materials that you want to make sure that the product gets properly moved in and out and around the, in throughout the container. It's basically a platform with a with a road. It's a rotating platform, and the uh, the uh, sweeper blade is actually fixed, and then your container would spin once it's on the platform, and then basically because it's on this spinning platform and the sweeper blade is fixed, that would would move the product off the container wall and push it into the middle of our container, where then the dispersing blade will take over and do the proper dispersing of, um, of our mill base. On top uh, right, we have a CDS system. That's our vacuum uh, attachment. So, for example, if certain products, you know, are air sensitive uh, or like an adhesive, you don't want any air, then the CDS is very helpful in removing that and then you uh, can disperse under these conditions. It has a, it's a closed chamber with a viewing glass on top. So you can actually see what's happening during the process. So it's not like the container is completely enclosed and you don't see what's going on. You can actually see the process and then you are uh, able to oscillate the blade, move, change the blade position. And then you can see that also what you're doing uh, because of that viewing glass. On top uh, right, we have that attachment is called a TML, and that is our basket mill. That's very helpful uh, if you're trying to mill uh, materials. So I just briefly want to go through a few models. If you're interested, this is our entry level model. It's called the LC. Just very simple speed display. It's got a timer function, and that's it. Uh, you have to lift. I'm not a fan of it personally, because I like to have the electric lift capability that allows me to really lock in the right dia uh, blade height in my container. And I don't want to do this by lifting up the motor head every time I want to change position. But that's what you have to do on the LC. You see that little uh, lever right next to the motor uh, on, the, on the stand. And that's what you have to open or close. And then it allows you to move the motor with a shaft up and down the column. Um, it's okay, it's not my favorite, but it's compar comparatively uh, an inexpensive lab scale solution. We also offer explosion proof models in that design, uh, but I wanna mention they all run on 400 uh, volt or 480 or 28, depending on the power in your building. So they're not single phase, they're all, all the explosion proof models are three phase machines. Then we have the CV line, which is actually our most popular lab scale model that has the same capabilities as the uh, LC, except you have now the automatic motor lift up and down. So you can really precisely position the blade in the container without having to do it uh, by moving the motor up and down by hand. It has a timer function, obviously the display of our current speed. But this one will also give you a torque reading and product temperature. Product temperature is really important if you want to convert the, this, the CV model to a basket mill or want to attach a basket mill or an APS, a vertical bead mill. That's when you really want to know what the temperature is during the milling process. So this particular model will give you that capability. Then we offer the CN, which is kind of like um, more a higher end model than the CV. You also have all the same safety features, uh, but you're able to really upskill with this particular model to stay within the same model family. I can go up to about 50 gallons of material if I'm getting a CN 
100, for example, and that would be allow you to really disperse large volumes for pilot scale. Uh, and it would, the same machine would be available for small lab scale as well. So you would stay within the same lab, uh, model family if you're trying to actually upscale. Um, same control capabilities, speed, torque, temperature, and timer function. And then again, it has the electric lift motor um, to properly position the blade in, in the container. And also I want to mention all of our motors uh, direct drive. We do not have any belts, uh, so there's no real maintenance. They are brushless step motors. They're extremely quiet. If you have never seen one at the next show, American or Western Coding Show, we'll have a model come up to the booth, we'll turn it on. You will not, you'd be surprised how quiet they are. You won't even know that they're running. Uh, and also they have very low vibration. You could put a quarter on top of the motor. It would not even move uh, because at high RPMs because they're so quiet and so stable. And then we have the uh, larger CN right here, same type of uh, capability, except this one is now for small production or pilot. And then this is our premium model, which is called the Dispermat AE. That model, have, as I have mentioned before, comes with that C technology package. If you're looking for something that where you want to have a recipe that you want to program, um, you want to store data on a, on a stick or on a PC for later uh, for creating lab reports. If you want to watch the dispersion process in real time, on a graphical interface, then you have these capabilities with that particular model. It's really good for upscale. Um, and you can get larger models, again, similar to the CN, all the way up, uh, in this case, to uh, 31 gallons of mill base. And also explosion-proof models are available. Um, here, same model except larger. And then we have the Dispermit SC for production up to 2,000 liters of product volume. We also have the quick change system, which is really cool uh, for production. You have one machine that can act as a disperser or dissolver or mixer. And then at the same time, you can convert it into a basket mill um, with the quick change system. We offer vacuum capability for manufacturing. Some people also for lab space, but that's a manufacturing skill. Some people prefer uh, you know, to do the dispersing process on the vacuum, remove all the air, and also doing milling. If you were to mill on the vacuum, uh, it improves our milling efficiency. Imagine like these um, these air bubbles in the mill base, they act like tiny little air mattresses, and they would actually buffer the blows of our beads if we were milling. So removing those air mattresses will get, get us better milling efficiency and a more homogeneous uh, a, a product. In some cases, we have the ability to add a nitrogen purging valve. Some people uh, like to do that in a dry environment, so they want nitrogen or another inert gas, so that's also possible in our models to add that. Okay, quality control. So this on the left here is that C technology package. Uh, again, you can see the RPMs on the top left. We have the in, in the middle, the middle left, the energy input. On the bottom, uh, the uh, torque value in Newton meters. Top right is our actual tip speed, 20.4. Uh, temperature readout, and then we have a timer function. Um, you can see that window on top right, those two little windows where you see a container with an impeller blade inside, and the bottom is that clamp of our um, dispermats. So if they appear green then you are safe to operate if they appear red uh, then you the machine will not run so both the safety features the container clamp has to has to be uh tight and also our working area has to be established and the blade what the milling disc has to be inside of the container otherwise the machine will not turn on uh, on the right side this is a different a very simple um, so pro, pro, a control panel for our C model, uh, which is good for production. It's very simple. Um, don't can't really break it. Um, it's perfect for that type of uh, environment. 
We have also that technology, um, LPC, where you control, where you actually make your own, create your own program or tie it into your own QC package. Some people have integrated scales. So with that solution, you basically control the process the way you want to control it, but you can also add different parameters um, that wouldn't be available otherwise. And now the problem with this particular solution is that it's made by Siemens and the lead times are excruciatingly long. I think the last I heard was like 12 months or 16 months lead time uh, if somebody would want that particular control capability. Um, on the higher model, we have the ability to program, program these called cutoff values so we can have a recipe uh, where we then obviously put in all the parameters that we want, even the height of our blade, um, timer, temperature, and then we have cutoff values. So let's say I have a temperature sensitive product. I can actually select, it has two warning zones and an action zone. So let's say I have ADC as my limit. I can have a warning at 60C, a warning at 70C, and then once it reaches ADC, uh, either shut that we can tell it to either shut the machine off or run at a different speed. So there are some ways that um, that those uh, warnings uh, signs can be dealt with. Um, and you can have also cutoff values for the energy input or the speed if you're running with constant power. If you're run running with constant speed, you can have uh, cutoff values for your power input. So there's a, no a number of ways on how you can modify uh, your process. Um, you can also see the entire dispersion process in real time and with these uh, trend lines for each of these variables uh, and that actually allows you to monitor uh, the entire dispersion process in real time. Uh, the net power calibration, I mentioned that earlier, it's basically running the, the machine without any product for a couple seconds and then uh, it will basically factor out the load it's using to operate itself without product and when you're running it with product, then you know all the values are the energy input, torque value are strictly related to, to your material. Uh, that's the software. Unfortunately, this is the old package. The Windows 10, the new one is not out yet. Uh, it still works. It's just dated in terms of how it looks, the GUI, uh, but it's very functional and it allows you to basically monitor and log all the process parameters and the dispersion process in real time uh, away from the dispermat in, in your lab or office, uh, wherever you have it hooked up. That's our applications lab in Germany. We have a lot of our different equipment, our attachments. We also have an upscale lab uh, downstairs. So if you wanna go and visit, please be our guest. We'd love to have you. But we also have capabilities at uh, Wallingford, Connecticut, and uh, we do the same thing. We love to have customers come in and we want to do a proof of concept, show them how it works. And um, we also added some additional new capabilities. So we have the AE6 on the left here with that C technology for ultimate process control. We also have a brand new media mill SL uh, with the nano attachment kit that allows us to really mill down our materials to submicron into the very, very low nanometer range. Also with the C technology package, uh, that what makes it really attractive is the whole line, same functionality on both systems, horizontal mill, vertical dissolver. Okay. So that covers it. Uh, for today, for most, just a quick overview on the Wallingford lab. It's a high-end class facility. Again, we want to have customers in to do the demos, proof of concept. Also invite our colleagues from the big additives team into maybe the meeting or the lab and give advice on how to improve a formulation or if there is an issue for flocculation or, you know, a better binder or you know, anything that will help improve the process or the product appearance, then we can offer those uh, support uh, mechanisms that we have in place. Uh, it's also great to leverage the synergy between the different divisions. And it's a showroom 
to show you if you don't want to run product, just come in and see what we offer. And then finally, we can also use it as a mailing uh, or a seminar location. If you have a larger group, you want to come in, learn about dispersing mailing, we can have that also um, set up for that. And um, that's it for today. I think we're pretty good on time. Um, I'll turn it back over to John for any questions. Thank you, Andy. Great stuff. As always, we appreciate your time and expertise. Um, have one question in here from Brittany, uh, and she writes, for the bead mill method in the dissolver step, would we expect to disperse until the donut effect was seen here as well? Um, so, hi, Brittany. Thank you for asking that question. So the donut effect actually is the result of dialing in uh, the the, the proper dispersion, pre-dispersion parameters. So when I, when I see the donut, I would basically keep it there for about 15, 20 minutes, uh, then take a sample, uh, you know, a quick, um, you know, on, on the grind gauge, a quick check will tell us if we are getting better <clears throat> pre-dispersion results, and then we would move over to the milling. So at that point, when I verify, okay, I'm within my 10 to 20 micron range, uh, then I can start, um, you know, adding my basket mill. Uh, right. The milling process. I hope this answered your question. Yeah. Um, Brittany, uh, did that answer your question? I unlocked your microphone. So if you'd like to chime in here, you can just unmute yourself on your end. Um, if you're able to, if not, that's okay too. You can type a chat. Oh, that explains it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, appreciate it. Um, if anyone else has any questions, we just have a couple minutes left. Um, just type it in the chat function. Um, Andy, you know, while we're waiting for that is, I, I guess, what's the, the most frequently asked question you get when um, uh, someone's, you know, getting into dispersion or looking to upgrade from um, lab pilot or, you know, to production? Yeah, I mean, there is always, obviously, a number of, of questions. So how well does, for example, a lab, a lab dissolver, how well our, our VMA product and this problems, how well do they scale? Um, usually for most applications, we can expect about, you know, at most a 15%, you know, uh, variance. Um, and we have to make some adjustments, but they're very scalable, uh, our production from our lab to our production equipment. Um, if you control all the parameters correctly, like the tape speed, uh, you know, the amount of energy we're putting in, the right geometry, uh, then the results should be pretty similar. Uh, of course, larger volume, usually we need a little bit more time, but like again, about 15% more time uh, is usually what, uh, what we see in terms of uh, upscale variance. Okay, thank you, uh, we appreciate it. Um, in the chat, I also did put uh, a link to the second part of this presentation, our media milling deep dive, it's scheduled for August 30 at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern, same time as um, today's. Uh, there's a link there. You can just click on that and register. Um, you'll also be sent um, invites uh, for this media milling uh, webinar as well as our other webinar series um, topics. Uh, so with that, um, thank you, Andy. Um, it's a pleasure as always. Um, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you on future uh, Big Gardener web seminars. Uh, thank you and have a great uh, rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time today and apologize again for the uh, little mishap there with the connection.